the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart thing came into being that has come into being. And God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night. And let them serve as signs to mark seasons and days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day, and the lesser light to govern the night. stars. God set them in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth, to govern the day and the night, and to separate light from darkness. saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning the fourth day. Good morning. I'm Jimmy. Thank you for joining us this Sunday as we go through part three of our Origins series. God's whole person wellness plan on our online church platform. Before we begin, I just would like to invite you to join me as we we'll bow our heads and close our eyes in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we just want to thank you, Lord, that we can spend this time to learn more about how you wish to bless us through sunlight and through the animals. And that, Lord, as we look at the evidence from science, from the Bible, Lord, we just want to thank you for being a God who's demonstrated um, how you love us and care for us so much. Help us to know how to apply what we learn um, and that it might be a blessing for us, for our families, and for those that we love. We ask all of this in your sons and Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, thank you once more for joining us. Um, and so let's launch straight off into our talk today. You know, the sun, the moon, the stars.
You know, in Genesis we read, Then God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years. And we know from the science that this is so. A 24-hour period is how long it takes for the earth to rotate once on its axes. How long it takes for the earth to rotate around the sun, that determines our year. And during the earth's orbit around the sun, the angle of the earth determines the differing seasons. We also know that a month is determined by the moon's rotation around the earth in relation to the sun-earth axis. And so what we read is true. Today, I want to pay particular attention on the sun. Now, something very interesting about the sun is that this star happens to be just the right size and just the right distance from us. If the sun was any larger, if it was a different type of star, if it was any closer, our atmospheres and our oceans would just boil away and the earth would be just a wasteland. Similarly, if the sun was a different type of star, a little bit smaller, a little bit further away, or our orbit was a little bit more elliptical, then our oceans would freeze over and life again could not be sustained. So things are set up just right for life. You know, sun keeps the plants alive, and in so doing, sun, the sun actually sustains all life on Earth. We know that excessive sunlight can cause problems, things like skin cancer, but did you know that there are significant health benefits from sunlight exposure? For instance, did you know that more people die from insufficient sunlight exposure than those who die from excess sunlight exposure? It is estimated in 2020 in America that 11,500 people died from skin cancer. In contrast, insufficient skin exposure, sun exposure is, was expected to cause 340,000 deaths in America alone and an additional 480,000 deaths in Europe every single year. That is many fold times more deaths from lack of sun than from the sun. Now, we know that uh, sunlight is very important for our bodies to produce a particular hormone called vitamin D. And it does this by, um, as UV light penetrates our skin, it causes our cholesterol to change and, uh, and through some chemical processes, it becomes the active form of vitamin D. And this is re really important because actually vitamin D, the major form of vitamin D for most of us is actually from sunlight exposure. We can get some from the diet, but the majority is from the sun. Now, also a lot of us knows that vitamin D is very important in how it takes care of our bones. We know that vitamin D is important because it regulates calcium absorption. And so through this, it helps to prevent rickets in children or osteomalacia in adults, which is very similar, an adult form of rickets. And enough vitamin D is also really important because it helps prevent osteoporosis, which is um, accelerated bone loss as, uh, as people age. It's also abnormal. We, uh, not everyone gets osteoporosis. But vitamin D has more impacts than just on calcium and, and just on bones. Vitamin D actually has a massive impact on cancer. Studies show that those with vitamin D levels of 20 nanomoles per liter, that's the Australian uh, measurements there, they had three times the risk of colon cancer compared to those who had 125 nanomoles per liter. Um, from a breast cancer perspective, we know that the risk of breast cancer or the incidence is decreased 70% if the vitamin D levels are high enough. And what's high enough? 112.5 nanomoles per liter compared to those with 30 animals per liter. And just so you get a sense, the figures of 20, 30, they're actually well within the clinical range of what we see day to day. Most people, I would say, who are not farmers, who are not laborers out in the sun, most people who are office workers, spend dimes indoors, students, 
most of us uh, who are not on supplements, most of us would have vitamin D levels sitting somewhere between the 30 to 40 to 50 range. So these levels are actually quite relevant for us today. Further, we know that the incidence of certain types of cancers increases the further away people are from the equator. Now, why is that important? Um, it's actually a proxy measure of how much sunlight exposure they're getting. For those at the equator, they get much more sunlight exposure than those who are higher north or further south compared to the equator. And it's a proxy for, uh, for their UVB exposure and thus their vitamin D production and the vitamin D levels. And so what we know is that the further away we are from the equator, and so therefore the less vitamin D one has, there is an increased incidence of colon cancer, breast cancer, pancreatic cancer, ovarian cancer, brain cancer, bladder cancer, kidney cancer, multiple myeloma, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. That list is a huge list. As Just as interesting as that is that mortality from sun-caused melanoma. So melanoma is the most significant and one of the most deadly types of skin cancer that people can get. And it's felt based on the current science that it could be due to excess sun exposure. For skin-based malignant melanoma, while the incidence is related to sun exposure, the death rate is actually the opposite. The closer to the equator, and so therefore the higher the, um, the levels of sun-induced vitamin D, the lower the death rate for melanoma. So I'll repeat that. The higher the vitamin D levels, in other words, the more sun exposure one has, the lower the death rate from melanoma. And we know that from population studies looking at cutaneous melanoma. Now, vitamin D also has a role in diabetes. We know that increasing vitamin D is associated with a decreased risk of developing type 1 diabetes. That's really important because um, unlike type 2 diabetes, once someone develops type 1 diabetes, that cannot be reversed. It's very, very hard to reverse. In a Finnish study, those who were regularly receiving vitamin D supplements as infants had a 90% lower risk of developing type 1 diabetes by the age of 31 years compared to those who were not on vitamin D supplements. And amongst those who were on the vitamin D supplements, those who were greater than 2,000 units a day had an 80% lower risk of developing type 1 diabetes compared to those who were supplemented on less than 2,000 units a day. And multiple other studies have confirmed and replicated these findings. Now, we think of cancer, we think of type 1 diabetes, which is an autoimmune disease. Um, and so we start to get a picture that vitamin D has a role on the immune system. And guess what? Studies show that. Studies show that vitamin D deficiency is felt to be a contributing factor to the rising rates of autoimmune diseases that we're seeing in society. And this includes for diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, for systemic lupus erythematosus, or SLE for short, short um, multiple sclerosis, and type 1 diabetes. Now, vitamin D is not only important for autoimmune diseases, it's also important for pregnant mums and developing babies. We know that low vitamin D during pregnancy causes a higher risk of mum having a condition called preeclampsia in pregnancy. Low vitamin D is also known to increase the risk of impaired fetal growth. Pregnant women given a vitamin D supplement had a 47% lower risk of having high blood pressure and high blood pressure related complications of pregnancy and also a 61% lower risk of preterm labor compared to women who were not given vitamin D supplements. And there are lots of other studies um, showing other health impacts on mums and especially pregnant mums and fetuses and infants. Now, 
this is probably a study that's really exciting and more relevant for us, especially in the scenario of COVID. Um, vitamin D and respiratory tract infections. One of the largest meta-analyses ever done was done by this gentleman called um, Dr. Martinu in uh, in 2017. Um, it's in a reputable journal. And what they found was that vitamin D supplements decreased the risk of both upper respiratory tract, that's your coughs and colds, and lower respiratory tract, so that's your chest infections and pneumonias. It, de it decreased upper respiratory tract and lower respiratory tract infections and also decreased influenza. And what was exciting was that for those who had very low vitamin D levels, their risk was decreased by about 50%. That's a huge decrease. For those who had a moderate degree of um, low vitamin D, so that their vitamin D states is, was about 25 or, or and above, there was a, uh, a less marked reduction in uh, infections, about a 10%. Other things that was important was that they found that the way they took vitamin D supplements was important. Taking it daily or weekly had an improvement and had improvements in immune function in terms of keeping infections at bay. But taking it monthly or less frequent than that did not have this benefit. And so the feeling was that when people are taking it monthly or th every three months, they take very, very big doses of vitamin D. And the feeling was that somehow that didn't, that didn't help the system. But it was a constant, consistent dosing of vitamin D that was important. And so that study has led to, and many others like it, has led people to look at whether vitamin D has a role in COVID. And obviously, this is still a developing area of research. I don't have anything to share at the moment about it. But it just is quite interesting to note that um, the former President Trump, when he and his wife got sick with COVID-19, amongst the treatments that they were on, vitamin D was one of those treatments that he was on. Now, how would, what would be the recommended level of vitamin D to keep coughs and colds at bay? Um, well, studies show that most people, it'd be appropriate to take between 2,000 to 4,000 international units a day. And that's quite a bit more than what currently we're recommending. The 4,000 international units a day is probably the safe upper limit of what we would take, um, um, some, some, what some researchers would say. And what we're trying to really achieve is a blood level of between 75 to 150 nanomoles per litre. Austra that's Australian measurements. Um, and so, um, and most of the studies show that the greatest benefit is more towards the 150 mark. So we're really trying to aim for a vitamin D level of 150. The toxic range, so that you've got an idea, at the toxic range of um, vitamin D is if someone takes 40,000 international units a day. So really, um, if you're taking 4,000 international units a day and you didn't check, it's fairly safe. We would still recommend that you check, but it's fairly safe because um, the toxic dose is more than 10 times that dose. Now, what's really important is that you know, a lot of research has been based around, oh, sunlight's great, particularly because vitamin D has so many roles and important functions in our body. So does that mean I just take a supplement? Well, I would encourage you that um, consider getting it from the sun. Why? Because sunlight is the natural way of getting vitamin D, but the other way, um, and it's obviously free, and it's much harder to overdose on the sun, apart from when you burn, obviously. Um, but the other reason is because the benefits of sunlight is actually much greater than just from its impact on vitamin D. So um, those of us who've joined online church for a number of sessions, some of you remember a talk that Dr. Aaron Coe and myself did on depression. We did a five-part series on depression last year. And we talked about how bright light improves mood and helps treat depression. That's sunlight. We also, if you've joined, if you um, remember from our origin series, part one of this series, I talked about how sunlight or bright light decreases the risk of someone uh, developing short sightedness. So, again, that's not a vitamin D impact. Sunlight decreases the risk of blood pressure and cardiovascular mortality, cardiovascular death risk. This was not through vitamin D. It decreases the risk of multiple sclerosis. And yes, we know that vitamin D has a role there, but it also impacts it through other mechanisms that are 
outside of vitamin D and we don't yet understand how it works through this. It also has an impact on the incidence of decreasing the risk of type 2 diabetes, of metabolic syndrome, of Alzheimer's and other cognitive disorders and cognitive impairments. Now, sunlight isn't just beneficial for us for our personal health, it's actually good in creating a clean environment as well. You know, sunlight kills bacteria indoors, even if it's through glass. Now, why is that exciting and important? We know that UV light kills bacteria, but when we get light through glass, the glass blocks out 99% of UV light. So what, that, what we're learning then is that sunlight kills bacteria by some mechanism outside of UV light. In one experiment, a type of bacteria called Group B hemolytic streptococci, this typically gives people sore throats and colds, um, this bacteria in just um, normal clear sky, blue sky daylight, it killed 50% of the bacteria, of this particular type of bacteria, in 50 minutes. Now, the same bacteria, when kept in a dark room, it took 24 hours for 50% of that bacteria to die. This, was, this experiment was not done with direct sun shining on the bacteria. All it was, was it was a blue sky and the light from a blue sky that entered the room diffusely onto a dish, a petri dish containing bacteria, that was what killed it. In other words, the sunlight had to go through, it wasn't direct sunlight, it was just indirect sunlight, and that indirect sunlight had to go through two layers of glass, and it still had the effect of killing 50% of the bacteria in under an hour. Artificial lighting did not have this effect. So that's quite astounding. Now, of course, what other benefits are there of sunlight? Well, it just makes us feel good. Sunlight triggers the release of endorphins, and it creates a sense of well-being. So, if I don't decide to get my vitamin D through supplements and I decide I want to get sunlight for the other additional benefits, how do I go about doing this? Well, one American study um, did look at this question and they, what they recommended was that 15 minutes of exposure to the face, the arms and the legs exposed at 40 degrees latitude between 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. two to three times a week in May to October was sufficient for those who had white skin. Um, they, what they meant by this type of white skin was that people who burned easily but, and rarely tanned, they, that's what the type of exposure they needed. Um, for those who had darker skin, they needed a longer exposure. Now, how does that translate to us living in Australia? Well, the May-October period is actually spring-summer. and so I would not recommend doing this in spring summer during their time period because we know that the sun for whatever reason is stronger in Australia and we have a higher incidence of melanoma. Possibly not because of the sun, but the research is still um, is still debating this. But we do know that you know um, there are danger periods um, for sun exposure and th that would be the danger period, 11 to 3 a.m. So we know that also Australia sits a little bit further down from the equator compared to 40 degrees latitude and so therefore we need a longer period of exposure. So, look, I would say similar time, but a little bit longer. So I would recommend if it was in summer, probably 15 minutes is okay, but I would definitely choose times outside the danger times. That's What's that? Usually between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. is danger. So before 10 and after 4. You would have to check your UV um, gauge and that day's UV rating on your weather apps to figure out exactly when the danger period is. But on average, before 10 a.m., after 4 p.m., that would be a good time to get some sun exposure. And so during this period, do not put on sunscreen. That would block all the beneficial effects of the UV light on creating vitamin D. Um, and just have your arms, your legs, your face exposed to the sun. You can still wear sunglasses but if, to protect your eyes, but you don't have to slip or slap during this time. The key, and this I really want to emphasize this so that people do not misunderstand, the key is not to get burnt. So... Yes, we want you to get sun exposure. This is actually really important for health, but it's a balance. If someone repeatedly burns, they're going to get skin cancer. And so we really, uh, for Australia, we would be aiming for 15 minutes 
Um, in winter in Australia, especially in Melbourne where I'm from, um, it will probably need longer. We're talking probably more like half an hour. And again, just be mindful, even on a cloudy day, people can burn. So I would still be again uh, asking people to do it outside of the danger period, but with face, arms and legs exposed. Now, as we reflect on all the blessings that sun sunlight gives us, you know, there's multiple blessings there, multiple health benefits. Um, we have to reflect on where does all these blessings come from? Who is the originator of these blessings? And I would put to you, it would be God. It would be Jesus. You know, we read in Malachi, But to you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness, shall arise with healing in his wings, and you shall go out and grow fat like store-fed calves. Who is the Son of Righteousness that Malachi talks about? No one other than Jesus, the Creator, the originator of the sun. He is the one who is our spiritual sunshine, our spiritual sunlight. You know, one of my favorite Christian authors writes this, that during his ministry, Jesus devoted more time to healing the sick than to preaching. His miracles testified to the truth of his words, that he came not to destroy, but to to save. Wherever he went, the tidings of his mercies preceded him. Where he passed, the objects of his compassion were rejoicing in health and making trial of their newfound powers. Crowds were collecting around them to hear from their lips the works that the Lord had wrought. His voice was a first sound that many had ever heard. His name, the first word that they had ever spoken. His face, the first that they ever looked upon. Why should they not love Jesus and sound his praise? As he passed through the towns and cities, he was like a vital current, diffusing life and joy. Friends, Jesus is no less powerful today. Today, he still walks through towns and cities, including your town and your city. But today, he chooses to let people learn from his health principles. He is no less willing to heal you today as in the days when he was in Israel, in Galilee. Today, however, he expects us to learn from his health principles and his health laws. And as we apply simple remedies, as we learn to obey his health laws, and as prayer is offered, Jesus heals. And God said, Let the water teem with living creatures. And let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea and every living and moving thing with which the water teems, according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the water in the seas, and let the birds increase on the earth.
And there was evening, and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, Let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, livestock, creatures that move along the ground, and wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. made the wild animals according to their kinds. The livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. The animals. When God created the animals, He created them to be our companions and for our enjoyment. God made the animals to be our friends, not our food. You know, when we read in Genesis, we read that then God blessed them, Adam and Eve, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. You know, God made us to be stewards over the animals. And that's probably why when we see animals, we still have you know, funny, warm feelings when we see and hug and interact with animals, even if some of those animals are now quite ferocious. You know, as we are... You know, and we just want to have a look at this uh, video now that... The new different side to hyenas and uh, explain to people that they're not these dirty, rotten, smelly, scavenging scoundrels, but actually highly intelligent social animals that have a equally important function to play in the ecosystem as lions. Let's see if I can get him to yawn. 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 There we go. Yawn. <laughs> take on rescues, but these two especially young George and uh, we decided to take them in on the provision that they would be used as ambassadors and spread the message so cub petting isn't just a, a problem uniquely to South Africa it is also a problem uh, that we see around the world and that we over here can also create awareness about 
And you know, as we watch this video, it's quite amazing to see um, this, this man's Kevin Richardson, he's based in South, South Africa. He's a conservationist and he's done a lot of work looking after wildlife in Africa, especially stopping and preventing people from having, you know, big game hunting. And you know, um, you know, why do we have such, you know, why do we find such fascination when we see people like Kevin Richardson um, interact with these lions and the hyenas? You know, it's because, you know, in our heart of hearts, we still long for that human to animal bonding that we had before the fall, before sin came into existence. You know, now, after the fall, you know, our relationship with some of these animals are predator and prey. Um, and so obviously a very different relationship now compared to what it was before the fall. And, you know, I, I suspect that some of this is to do with the longing that we have of what life could have been as opposed to how it is right now. Um, but quite aside from that, um, animals, the research is starting to show, might have more benefits for us apart from just being our companions. Now, this is a really interesting and new area of research. I just want to emphasize that. And some of the evidence here is still not yet strong. I don't think it'd be accurate for us to say that all the evidence here is strong. Uh, but there is, a very, there is a growing body of data showing us that, that interacting with animals is beneficial for our health. And particularly, um, there is a therapy called Animal Assisted Therapy. And this therapy seems particularly um, to show um, good promise, uh, a promising effect in terms of effectiveness in decreasing pain, decreasing distress and anxiety. You know, we know from studies, we know that stroking an animal, grooming a cat, or otherwise engaging with an animal um, certainly releases happy hormones, you know. And, you know, uh, the scientists have looked at that and drawn blood from people that have done this. And we know that as we do this, it releases oxytocin. This is the hormone that's often associated with love and bonding. Uh, it releases serotonin, dopamine, another reward center hormone, endorphins, another happy feeding hormones, and prolactin. Just as importantly, the scientists found that cortisol or a stress hormone was reduced when we interact with animals and that interacting with animals created the sense of well-being. Pet owners, especially dogs and cats, um, are more likely to have a lower blood pressure. And pets, this is particularly the case for dogs, dog owners have significantly greater physical activity. I want to have a look at some of the research later on. Dog walkers have lower rates of obesity and Although, and though this seems to be more because that their furry friends help to remind them that they have to walk every day. And also, studies show that younger children who have had a dog, who grow up with a dog in the family, they have a 50% lower risk of being overweight or obese compared to families with young children without pets. Now, here's this um, little bit of data from one of the research articles. And here's really interesting. Uh, this is which they were looking to see how much walking people would do. And at baseline, all these animals were open to owning pets, but didn't have any. And then they divided them into three groups. One group uh, were offered to look after a dog. One group, a dog per, uh, per uh, family. The other group were offered to look after a cat per family. And then one, the third group, they continued to have no pets. And so they just checked their walking level at... Uh, um, one month after they took up, uh, they had their pet. Six months after they had their pets, and ten months after they had their pets. And what we find is that um, across the board, owning a dog was most beneficial in terms of increasing walking. You can just see me as I put my cursor across the screen. That dog walking, uh, walking rather, was the, the greatest in those who own dogs, and that this increase in walking um, continued with the lapse of time. didn't fade away. Another interesting area of research is how animals interact and cause us to have changes in our cardiovascular reactivity. When pet owners face stress, researchers found that they had lower baseline heart rates and blood pressure. They had smaller rises in heart rate and blood pressure during the stressful event. And they also had a faster return to their baseline heart rate and blood pressure after the stressor was removed. Um, reactivity to stress was lowest and recovery fastest when their pets were present with the couples or present with the re uh, research candidates during the stressor. 
um, he, and here is um, some of the data from that research. So what we're seeing here is that the black solid bars are the responses of those who had no pets. Um, the grey bars were the responses of those people who had pets. And they only had the pets for six months. And so at baseline, no one had pets, and but everyone was open to the idea of owning a pet. And then they just randomly assigned half to have no pets to continue to have no pets. And then the other half, they said, okay, you can own a, own a pet. And so what they found was that for blood pressure and for heart rate, during the stressful, uh, the stress events was doing some really, really challenging maths or public speaking. And we all know that public speaking is um, more feared than death itself. So, so they, ch they just, um, that was their stressors. And what we find is that across the board, having a pet makes a difference. Their heart rates were lower and their blood pressure was less during the stressful event. Now, many studies also demonstrates this uh, the benefits in elderly populations. In the elderly, they had lower blood pressure, decreased use of antidepressants, they had used of fewer medical surfaces, they had better cardiovascular fitness, better quality of life, and also a better sense of well-being um, when the elderly had pets versus those who didn't have pets. This is also true for younger populations as well. Now, um, there are a number of studies looking particularly at the use of animals. So this is where we're talking about the animal-assisted therapy. Um, uh, looking at the use of animals in mental health. And encouragingly, what researchers have found is that, especially in the uh, adolescent group, um, they found that their engagement with mental health services were better, with less disruptive behavior and improved global function when pets were involved. In addition to that, they found that there was additional benefits on top of standard therapy for certain mental health disorders. And these were particularly the internalizing disorders like depression and also for post-traumatic stress disorder. And that the pet therapy was equivalent to standard treatments for anxiety, for anger, and for also for externalizing disorders. Animal-assisted therapy also improved mood in the elderly uh, residents um, when they were in long-term care facilities, and it also prevented escalations in aggravation, uh, agitation rather, and aggression in those who were suffering from dementia. So it didn't actually change how um, uh, it didn't change the course of their dementia, which obviously we wouldn't expect it to. But what we did find was that the animals had a calming effect, so that when they were moved into a new environment. Um, those who didn't have pets became agitated and aggressive, whereas those who did, did not become as aggressive or didn't become agitated or aggressive as often. It also obviously reduces loneliness and social, uh, and social isolation, but studies have proven that as well. Obviously, owning a pet and having an animal um, isn't for everyone. So there are you know pros and cons to this, and I guess one of the things that we need to consider before taking up pet ownership is that it's expensive. Um, and also, pets are, you know, they're, they're a, a, a live thing. You, you can't treat them as a toy. Once you have them, you hopefully just don't, when you, you know, you don't just get rid of them like with toys when, they, when they're used. Um, you have to, we have to look after them. Um, the other thing, obviously, to be mindful of is if we're considering pet therapy is whether it's appropriate for the environment because they can become tripping hazards or force hazards for the elderly. Also, from a mental health perspective, um, animals can die and so if they die before the owner dies um, this can obviously cause upset and grieving um, and the grief is often as significant as if a, fam a human family member died and so this is something that uh, people should take into account of uh, when think considering pet ownership from a health perspective um, and then obviously there's the other um, events that can occur because animals you know are animals after all and they can occasionally be wild um, and return to wild tendencies. So injuries from biting, or sometimes just not even injuries, but just um, cross infections. You know, there's infections that usually are in animals but can cross across to humans are possible as well. Now I want to move to a, um, an interesting part of our talk. I want to talk about God and the animals. You know, God not only created the animals at creation 
for our enjoyment. But I believe that God cares for the animals as well. And God also intends to have animals in the new heavens and the new earths. When all things are made new, when sin is finally done away with after Jesus' second coming. And we get, a, we get a sense of this from the Bible. It's actually found in Isaiah. In Isaiah 11, it's mentioned twice. Isaiah 11, verse 6 and 9. We read that the wolf shall also dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat. The calf and the young lion and the fatling together. And a little child shall lead them. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. Now, in this day and age, since that was written till now, it's, um, it's quite clear that a an, little child should not lead a leopard or a wolf or, or a lion. So we know that this has not yet occurred. But it becomes more clear when we read further on in Isaiah, in Isaiah 65, where it says, See, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like an ox, and dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, says the Lord. And so here we get a good sense, a very clear sense that in heaven, God has animals as well. You know, Jesus is still the God of nature. He created nature, he created the animals, and God is still the God of animals as well. And so, as we reflect on it, just as Jesus calmed the storm, on the Sea of Galilee, when his disciples were freaking out and they were all thinking that they were about to drown and the boat was about to sink. Just as Jesus calmed that storm, Jesus asked a big fish, we don't know if it was a whale or what, but he asked a big fish to swallow wayward Jonah when he was trying to run away. And the fish saved Jonah so that Jonah would not drown. We see that in the Bible that God uses the animals to continue to bless his people in special ways. We read that Jesus, when Elijah was in the wilderness, in the three and a half years of known rain, that in the initial period when he had to hide behind a creek and there was no food, God sent ravens to feed prophet Elijah. We read that when Daniel was faithful to the call of being a Christian and he would choose to rather obey God rather than man and so therefore chose to pray to God knowing that the penalty would be being thrown into a lion's den. We see that Jesus again comes through for those who believe in him and Jesus sends an angel to shut the mouths of the lions so that Daniel was not eaten. You know, Jesus is no different today. God still uses animals to bless his people. You know, this is a very interesting article. This is a real life incident. Um, something that happened in 2005 in Ethiopia. And um, the, from what we can gather, uh, what happened was that this Ethiopian girl came from a little uh, village that was a Christian village. And unfortunately, in Ethiopia, it's not uncommon for there to be kidnappings um, of young girls for forced marriages. Um, so... And unfortunately, this little girl on the way back from school was kidnapped. And so the family were really concerned. And so they obviously prayed and were really worried. And this poor girl was um, grabbed by seven men. And they beat her and did all sorts of nasty things to her, trying to force her to marry one of them. Now, what happened was that um, obviously the police were already in, got involved and the police were trying to find where this gang of people were. And so... Um, the, the gang of seven men with the captive, with the girl, um, they had to be on the move. And so about a week down the track after she was kidnapped, as the gang were leading the girl to another site because the police were about to catch on to where they were, um, they came across um, three lions. And the three lions chased the men away. I mean, I think if I saw one lion, I'd run in the opposite direction. So seeing three, it makes sense that you would run away. So these guys... These, uh, the gang who had kidnapped and hurt the girl, they ran away. Uh, and they left the girl. They, you know, they, they were more, more keen to be alive rather than to be the, the lion's meal. Um, and they just left the girl there. And uh, the girl was too distraught, too traumatized, to, and so she just stayed there. And what was really interesting was that the lions chased the men away, and then the lions just sat there, a short distance from the girl, but they didn't harm her. And we get to learn about this because... The girl obviously lived, 
uh, but also that the police finally caught up with the girl about half a day later. And the, this is one of the um, group, this police officer, his name's uh, Wandemu uh, Wadaj. He was amongst the search party that found the girl. And what they said was that they, the lions, stood guard until we found her. And then they just left her like a gift and went back into the forest. Everyone thinks this is some kind of miracle because normally the lions would attack people. Um, and it's true. The lions in Ethiopia are known to attack people. Um, but in this case, the three lions just sat and watched over the girl and didn't do anything to harm her until the police arrived. And when the police arrived, the lions just stood up and walked off. Amazing. I think that's incredible. You know, God still uses the animals to bless his people. And certainly I think God answered the prayer of um, this girl's family who were praying for her. You know, as we reflect on today's um, lessons, you know, we reflect on the blessings of sunlight, you know. Just want to summarize that there are multiple and um, beneficial effects from sunlight. And a lot of these are from its impact on vitamin D and vitamin D production. It is obviously beneficial for our bone health, but also it inv uh, it's beneficial for our immune system. And because of its impact on the immune system, it has multiple other health benefits, which include effects, beneficial effects on cancer prevention, on prevent, possibly preventing autoimmune disease, um, on helping to decrease the incidence of multiple respiratory tract infections, including viruses. It's benef uh, beneficial effects in pregnancy. We also know that direct sunlight, outside of its vitamin D effects, also have an effect on the circadian rhythm. It helps to improve mood. It helps with decreasing the risk of short-sightedness. It has um, beneficial effects on both the cardiovascular disease and cognitive illnesses, and it also kills a variety of bacteria and microbes. You know, the blessings of animals. Early studies suggest that it improves health, particularly in dealing with pain, dealing with distress, dealing with anxiety, and certain mental health conditions, particularly internalizing disorders and post-traumatic stress. And that in those who are suffering from dementia and have it in a more advanced stage, it helps decrease the risk of agitation and aggression when they're disorientated. Um, and just as important is that the blessings of sunlight and the blessings of animals come because they come from God, the source of all blessing. That Jesus is our sunlight. He is our sunshine. And that Jesus is still the God of nature, still the God of the animals, just as he was in the days of Jonah, in the days of Elijah the prophet, in the days of Daniel. Just so today he still uses animals to be a blessing for those who are his people. And so really God has provided all of our has provided for all of our needs at the creation and continues to do so. You know, as we finish for our talk today, I'd just like to invite you to bow your heads with me as we say a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, as we re have reviewed the evidence for the blessings of sunshine, which are many and vast and far-reaching, as we look at the preliminary evidence, looking at how animals are a blessing for us, not just for companionship, but also from a mental health perspective, and excitingly, also from a um, cardiovascular perspective, uh, cardiovascular perspective and also from a dealing with stress perspective that Lord uh, we just want to remember the origins and the source of all these blessings that Lord you are our spiritual sunshine you are our, the God of the nature that blesses us and so Lord we just want to ask at this time that you will continue to speak to us to know how to apply these um, lifestyle changes in a way that will be a blessing for us and also be able to um, share this with those around us so that it might be a blessing to those around us as well. We just want to thank you, Lord, for hearing this prayer. We ask all of this in your Son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. So thank you, everyone, for joining us once more for Origins Part 3 of God's Whole Person Wellness Plan. We looked at that sunshine and the blessings it offers and at the animals and the blessings that that offers. Next week, we'll be looking at something very exciting once more. We're going to be looking at the purpose 
of life. Why do you exist? And I think this is a question that many, many people have asked. And I've certainly had a number of patients ask me this question. So next week is certainly a hot topic not to be missed. Uh, Once more, thank you for joining us on Online Church. And just a reminder again, we'll be here again, same time, same place at 10 a.m. Sunday, Australian Eastern Standard Time. uh, Thank you once more. And we look forward for you to joining us again next week on Origins, God's Whole Person Wellness Plan. Thank you.